desperate to sit down and take the weight from his trembling leg. What was Goyle doing at the university? Goyle and Vitari and two dozen practicals, all armed as if they were going to war. He took a wincing step over the threshold. There must be some... Gah! He felt his cane snatched away, and he lurched sideways, clutching at the air. Something crunched into his face and filled his head with blinding pain. The next moment, the floor thumped him in the back and drove his wind out in a long sigh. He blinked and slobbered, mouth salty with blood, the dark room swaying madly around him. Oh dear, oh dear, a fist in the face, unless I am much mistaken, it never loses its impact. A hand grabbed the collar of his coat and dragged him up, the cloth cutting into his throat and making him squawk like a strangled chicken. Another had him by the belt, and he was hauled bodily along, his knees and the toes of his boots scraping limp over the boards. He struggled weakly on a reflex, but only managed to send a stab of pain through his own back. The bathroom door cracked against his head and banged open on the wall. He was dragged powerless across the darkened room towards the bath, still full of dirty water from that morning. Wait! he croaked as he was wrestled over the edge. Who up? <coughs> the cold water closed around his head. The bubbles rushed around his face. He was held there, struggling, eyes bulging open with shock and panic, until it seemed his lungs would burst. Then he was yanked up by the hair, water pouring from his face and splattering into the bath. A simple technique, but undeniably effective. I am greatly discomforted. He took in a gasping breath. <gasps> what do you... <clears throat> Back into the darkness, such air as he had managed to drag in, gurgling out into the dirty water. But whoever it is, let me breathe. I am not being murdered. I am being softened up. Softened up for questions. I would laugh at the irony. Were there any breath left in my body? He shoved at the bath and thrashed at the water. His legs kicked pointlessly, but the hand on the back of his neck was made of steel. His stomach clenched and his ribs heaved, desperate to drag in air. Do not breathe, do not breathe, do not breathe. He was just sucking in a great lungful of dirty water as he was snatched up from the bath and flung onto the boards, coughing, gasping, vomiting all at once. You are Glockta? A woman's voice, short and hard, with a rough cantic accent. She squatted down in front of him, balanced on the balls of her feet, her wrists resting on her knees, her long brown hands hanging limp. She wore a man's shirt, loose around her scrawny shoulders, wet sleeves rolled up around her bony wrists. Her black hair was hacked off short and stuck from her head in greasy clumps. She had a thin, pale scar down her hard face, a scowl on her thin lips, but it was her eyes that were most off-putting, gleaming yellow in the half-light from the corridor. Small wonder that Severard was reluctant to follow her. I should have listened to him. You are Glockta? There was no point denying it. He wiped the bitter drool from his chin with a shaking hand. I am Glockta. Why are you watching me? He pushed himself painfully up to sitting. What makes you think I will have anything to say to— Her fist struck him on the point of his chin and snapped his head back, tore a gasp out of him. His jaws banged together, and one tooth punched a hole in the bottom of his tongue. He sagged back against the wall, the dark room lurching, his eyes filling up with tears. When things came back into focus, she was staring at him, yellow eyes narrowed. I will keep eating you until you give me answers or you die. My thanks. Thanks? I think you might have loosened my neck up just a fraction. Glockta smiled, showing her his few bloody teeth. For two years I was a captive of the Gurkish. Two years in the darkness of the Emperor's prisons. Two years of cutting and chiseling and burning. Do you think the thought of a slap or two scares me? He chuckled bloody laughter in her face. It hurts more when I piss.
Do you think I'm scared to die? He grimaced at the stabbing through his spine as he leaned towards her. Every morning that I wake up alive is a disappointment. If you want answers, you'll have to give me answers. Like for like. She stared at him for a long moment, not blinking. You are a prisoner of the Gurkish? Glockter swept a hand over his twisted body. They gave me all this. Huh. We have both lost something to the Gurkish, then. She slid down onto crossed legs. Questions, like for like. But if you try to lie to me, questions, then. I would be failing in my duties as a host if I did not allow you to go first. She did not smile, but then she does not seem the joking type. Why are you watching me? I could lie, but for what? I might as well die telling the truth. I am watching Baez. The two of you seem friendly, and Baez is hard to watch these days, so I am watching you. She scowled. He is no friend of mine. He promised me vengeance, that is all. He has yet to deliver. Life is full of disappointments. Life is made of disappointments. Ask your question, Cripple. Once she has her answers, will it be bath time again, and this time my last? Her flat yellow eyes gave nothing away, empty like the eyes of an animal. But what are my choices? He licked the blood from his lips and leaned back against the wall. I might as well die a little wiser. What is the seed? Her frown deepened by the smallest fraction. Bayaz said it is a weapon, a weapon of very great power, great enough to turn Shaffer to dust. He thought it was hidden at the edge of the world, but he was wrong. He was not happy to be wrong. She frowned at him for a silent moment. Why are you watching Bayaz? Because he stole the crown and put it on a spineless worm. She snorted. There at least we can agree. There are those in my government who worry about the direction in which he might take us. Who worry profoundly. Glockter licked at one bloody tooth. Where is he taking us? He tells me nothing. I do not trust him, and he does not trust me. There, too, we can agree. He planned to use the seed as a weapon. He did not find it, so he must find other weapons. My guess is he is taking you to war, a war against Kalul and his eaters. Glockter felt a flurry of twitches run up the side of his face and set his eyelid fluttering. Damn treacherous jelly. Her head jerked to the side. You know of them? A passing acquaintance. Well, where's the harm? I caught one in Degoska. I asked it questions. What did it tell you? It talked of righteousness and justice. Two things that I have never seen. It talked of war and sacrifice. Two things that I have seen too much of. It said that your friend Baez killed his own master. The woman did not move so much as an eyelash. It said that its father, the prophet Kalul, still seeks vengeance. Vengeance, she hissed, her hands bunching into fists. I will show them vengeance. What did they do to you? They killed my people. She uncrossed her legs. They made me a slave. She rose smoothly to her feet, looming over him. They stole my life from me. Glockter felt the corner of his mouth twitch up. One more thing we have in common. And I sense my borrowed time is up. She reached down and grabbed two fistfuls of his wet coat. She dragged him from the floor with fearsome strength, his back sliding up the wall. Body found floating in the bath? He felt his nostrils opening wide, the air hissing fast in his bloody nose, his heart thumping in anticipation.
No doubt my ruined body will struggle as best it can, an irresistible reaction to the lack of air, the unconquerable instinct to breathe. No doubt I will thrash and wriggle, just as Tulkis, the Gurkish ambassador, thrashed and wriggled when they hanged him and dragged his guts out for nothing. He did his twisted best to stay up under his own power, to stand as close to straight as he could manage. After all, I was a proud man once, even if that is all far behind me. Hardly the end that Colonel Glockter would have hoped for. Drowned in the bath by a woman in a dirty shirt. Will they find me slumped over the rim, my ass in the air? But what does it matter? It is not how you die, but how you lived that counts. She let go of his coat, flattened the front with a slap of her hand. And what has my life been these past years? What do I have that I might truly miss? Stairs? Soup? Pain? Lying in the darkness with the memories of the things I have done digging at me? Waking in the morning to the stink of my own shit? Will I miss tea with R.D. West? A little, perhaps. But will I miss tea with the Arch Lecter? It almost makes you wonder why I didn't do it myself years ago. He stared into his killer's eyes, as hard and bright as yellow glass, and he smiled, a smile of the purest relief. I am ready. For what? She pressed something into his limp hand, the handle of his cane. If you have more business with Bayaz, leave me out of it. I will not be so gentle next time. She backed slowly towards the doorway, a bright rectangle against the shadowy wall. She turned, and the sound of her boots receded down the corridor. Aside from the soft tip-tap of water dripping from his wet coat, all fell silent. And so it seems I survive. Again. Glockter raised his eyebrows. Perhaps the trick is not wanting to. Chapter 25 The Fourth Day He was an ugly bastard, this Easterner, a huge big one dressed all in stinking half-tanned furs and a bit of rusted chainmail, more ornament than protection. Greasy black hair, bound up here and there with rough-forged silver rings, dripped with the thin rain. He had a great scar down one cheek and another across his forehead, and the countless nicks and pittings of lesser wounds and boils as a lad, nose flattened and bent sideways like a dented spoon. His eyes were screwed up tight with effort, his yellow teeth were bared, the front two missing, his grey tongue pressed into the gap. A face that had seen war all its days, a face that had lived by sword and axe and spear and counted every day alive a bonus. For Logan, it was almost like looking in a mirror. They held each other as tight as a pair of bad lovers, blind to everything around them. They lumbered back and forward, lurching like feuding drunkards. They plucked and tugged, bit and gouged, gripped and tore, strained in frozen fury, blasting sour breath in each other's faces. An ugly and a wearying and a fatal dance, and all the while the rain came down. Logan took a painful dig in the gut and had to twist and wriggle to smother a second. He gave a half-hearted headbutt and did nothing more than scuff Ugly's face with his forehead. He nearly got tripped, stumbled, felt the Easterner shift his weight, trying to find a set to throw him. Logan managed to dig him in the fruits with his thigh before he could do it, enough to make his arms go weak for a moment, enough so he could slide his hand up onto Ugly's neck. Logan forced that hand up, inch by painful inch, his stretched-out forefinger creeping over the Easterner's pitted face while he peered down at it, cross-eyed, trying to tip his head out of the way. His hand gripped painful tight round Logan's wrist, trying to haul it back, but Logan had his shoulder dipped, his weight set right. 
The finger edged past his grimacing mouth, over his top lip, into Ugly's bent nose, and Logan felt his broken nail digging at the flesh inside. He crooked his finger and bared his teeth and twisted it about as best he could. The Easterner hissed and thrashed around, but he was hooked. He'd no choice but to grab at Logan's wrist with his other hand and try to drag that tearing finger out of his face. But that left Logan one hand free. He snatched a knife out and grunted as he stabbed, his arm jerking in and out. Quick punches, but with steel on the end of them. The blade squelched in the Easterner's gut and his thigh and his arm and his chest, blood coming out in long streaks, splattering them both and trickling into the puddles under their boots. Once he was stabbed enough, Logan caught him by his coat, hauled him into the air with a jaw-clenched effort, and roared as he flung him over the battlements. He plummeted away, limp as a carcass, and soon to be one, crashed to the ground in among his fellows. Logan bent over the parapet, gasping at the wet air, the raindrops flitting down away from him. There were hundreds of them, it seemed like, milling around in the sea of mud at the base of the wall. Wild men from out past the crinna, where they hardly spoke right and cared nothing for the dead. They all were rain-soaked and filth-spattered, hiding under rough-made shields and waving rough-forged weapons, barbed and brutal. Their standards stood flapping in the rain behind them, bones and ragged hides, ghostly shadows in the downpour. Some were carrying rickety ladders forwards, or lifting those that had been thrown down, trying to foot them near the wall and haul them up, while rocks and spears and sodden arrows flapped and splattered into the mud. Others were climbing, shields held over their heads, two ladders up at Dow's side, one on Red Hat's side, one just to Logan's left. A pair of big savages were swinging great axes against the scarred gates, chopping wet splinters out with every blow. Logan pointed at them, screamed uselessly into the wet. No one heard him, or could have, over the great noise of drumming rain, of crashing, thudding, scraping blades on shields, shafts in flesh, battle cries, and shrieks of pain. He fumbled his sword up from the puddles on the walkway, dull metal glistening with beads of water. Just near him, one of Shiver's carls was facing off against an Easter who'd scrambled from the top of a ladder. They traded a couple of blows, axe against shield, then sword swishing at the empty air. The Easterner's axe arm went up again, and Logan hacked it off at the elbow, stumbled into his back, and knocked him screaming on his face. The Carl finished him with a chop to the back of the skull, pointed his bloody sword over Logan's shoulder. There! Another Easterner with a big hook nose just getting to the top of the ladder, leaning forward over the battlements, right arm going back with a spear ready. Logan bellowed as he came for him. His eyes went wide and the spear wobbled, too late to throw. He tried to swing out of the way, clinging to the wet wood with his free hand, but only managed to drag the ladder grating across the battlements. Logan's sword stabbed him under the arm and he flailed back with a grunt dropping his spear behind him. Logan stabbed at him again, slipped, and lunged too far, near falling into his arms. Big Nose clawed at him, trying to bundle him over the parapet. Logan smashed him in the face with the pommel of his sword and knocked his head back, took some teeth out with a second blow. The third one knocked him senseless, and he fell back off the ladder, plummeting down and taking one of his friends into the mud with him. Bring that pole! Logan roared at the carl with the sword. What? Pole, you fucker! The Carl snatched the wet length of wood up and threw it through the rain. Logan dropped his sword and wedged the branched end against one upright of the ladder, started pushing for all he was worth. The Carl came and added his weight to it, and the ladder creaked, wobbled, and started tipping back. An Easterner's face came up over the battlements, surprised looking. He saw the pole. He saw Logan and the Carl growling at it. He tumbled off as the ladder dropped away, down on the heads of the bastards below. Further along the wall, another ladder had just been pushed back up, and the Easterners were starting to climb it, shields up over their heads, while Red Hat and his boys chucked rocks at them. 
Some had got to the top over on Dow's bit of the wall, and he could hear the shouting from there, the sounds of murder. Logan gnawed at his bloody lip, wondering whether to push on down there and give them some help, but he decided against. He'd be needed here before long. So he took up the maker's sword, and he nodded to the Carl who'd helped him, and he stood and caught his breath. He waited for the Easterners to come again, and all around him men fought and killed and died. Devils in a cold, wet, bloody hell. Four days of it now, and it felt as if he'd been there forever, as if he'd never left. Perhaps he never had. Like the dogman's life weren't difficult enough already, there had to be rain. Wet was an archer's worst fear, all right, apart from being ridden down by horsemen, maybe, but that weren't so likely up a tower. The bows were slippery, the strings were stretchy, the feathers were sodden, which all made for some ineffective shooting. Rain was costing them their advantage, and that was a worry. But it could cost them more than that before the day was out. There were three big wild bastards working at the gates, two swinging heavy axes at the softened wood, the third trying to get a pry bar in the gaps they'd made and tear the timbers apart. If we don't deal with them, they'll have those gates in, Dogman shouted hoarse into the wet air. I said Grim, nodding his head, water flicking off his shaggy thatch of hair. Took a good bit of bellowing and pointing from him and Tull, but Dogman got a crowd of his lads lined up by the slick parapet. Three score wet bows, all lowered at once, all drawn back, creaking, all pointing down towards that gate. Three score men, frowning and taking aim, all dripping with water and getting wetter every minute. All right, then, loose! The bows went more or less together, the sounds muffled. The shaft spun down, bouncing off the wet wall, sticking in the rough wood of the gate, prickling the ground all round where the ditch used to be before it became just another load of mud. Not what you'd call accurate, but there were a lot of shafts, and if you can't get quality, then numbers will have to do the job for you. The Easterner on the right dropped his axe, three arrows sticking out his chest, one through his leg. The one on the left slipped and fell on his side, went floundering for cover, an arrow in his shoulder. The one with the bar went down on his knees, thrashing around and grabbing behind him, trying to get at a shaft in the small of his back. All right, good, the dogman shouted. None of the rest of them seemed keen to try the gate for the moment, which was something to be grateful for. There were still plenty trying the ladders, but that was a harder task to deal with from up here. They might just as easily shoot their own boys on the walls as the enemy in this weather. Dogman gritted his teeth and loosed a harmless, looping wet arrow down into the milling crowd. Nothing they could do. The walls was Shiver's job, and Dow's and Red Hat's. The walls was Logan's job. There was a crack, loud as the sky falling. The world went reeling bright and soupy slow, sounds all echoing. Logan stumbled through this dream place, the sword clattering out of his stupid fingers, lurched against the wall and grappled with it as it swayed around, trying to understand what had happened and not getting there. Two men were struggling with each other over a spear, wrestling and jerking round and round, and Logan couldn't remember why. A man with long hair took a great slow blow with a club on his shield, a couple of splinters spinning, then he swept an axe round, teeth bared and shining, caught a wild-looking man in the legs and tore him off his feet. There were men everywhere, wet and furious, dirt and blood-stained. A battle, maybe? Which side was he on? Logan felt something warm tickling his eye, and he touched his hand to it frowned down at his red fingertips, turning pink as the rain pattered on them. Blood. Had someone hit him on the head then? Or was he dreaming it? A memory from long ago. He spun round just before the club came down and crushed his skull like an egg, caught some hairy bastard's wrists with both hands. The world was suddenly fast, noisy, pain pulsing in his head. 
He lurched against the parapet, staring into a dirty, bearded, angry face pressed up tight against his. Logan let go the club with one hand, started snatching at his belt for a knife. He couldn't feel one. All that time spent sharpening all those blades, and now he needed one, there was nothing to hand. Then he realized. The blade he was looking for was stuck in that ugly bastard down in the mud somewhere at the base of the wall. He scrabbled round the other side of his belt, still wrestling at the club, but losing that battle now, given that he only had the one hand to work with. Logan got bent back slowly over the battlements. His fingers found the grip of a knife. The hairy Easterner tore his club free and lifted it up, opening his mouth wide and giving a stinking yell. Logan stabbed him right through the face, and the blade went through one cheek and out the other and took a couple of teeth with it. Harry's bellow turned to a high-pitched howl, and he dropped his club and stumbled away, eyes bulging. Logan slid down and snatched his sword from under the trampling feet of the two fighting over the spear, waited a moment for the Easterner to come round close to him, then chopped through the back of one thigh and brought him down with a scream where the Carl could see to him. Harry was still drooling blood, one hand on the grip of the knife through his face, trying to work it free. Logan's sword made a red gash through the wet furs on his side, brought him to his knees. The next swing split his head in half. Not ten strides away, Shivers was in bad trouble, backed up with three Easterners at him, another just getting to the top of a ladder, and all his boys kept busy behind. He winced as he took a hard blow from a hammer across his shield, stumbled back, his axe dropping from his hand and clattering on the stone. The thought did pass through Logan's mind that he'd be a deal better off if Shivers got his head flattened, but the odds were good that he'd be next. So he took a great breath and bellowed as he charged. The first one turned just in time to get his face hacked open rather than the back of his skull. The second got his shield up, but Logan went low and chopped clean through his shin instead, sent him shrieking down onto his back, blood pumping out into the pools of water across the walkway. The third one was a big bastard, wild red hair sticking all ways off his head. He had shivers stunned and on his knees by the parapet, his shield hanging down, blood running from a cut on his forehead. Red hair raised a big hammer up to finish the job. Logan stabbed him through the back before he got the chance, the long blade sliding through him right to the hilt. Never take a man face to face if you can kill him from behind, Logan's father used to say, and that was one good piece of advice he'd always tried to follow. Red hair thrashed and squealed, twisting madly with his last breaths, dragging Logan around after him by the hilt of his sword, but it wasn't long before he dropped. Logan grabbed Shivers under the arm and hauled him up. He frowned hard as his eyes came back into focus, saw who was helping him. He leaned down and snatched his fallen axe up from the stones. Logan wondered for a moment if he was about to get it buried in his skull, but Shivers only stood there, blood running down his wet face from the cut across his head. Behind you, said Logan, nodding past his shoulder. Shivers turned, Logan did the same, and they stood with their backs to each other. There were three or four ladders up now, around the gate, and the battle on the walls had broken up into a few separate, bloody little fights. There were Easterners clambering over the parapet, screaming their meaningless jabber, hard faces and hard weapons glistening wet, coming at Logan along the wall, while more dragged themselves up. Behind him he heard the clash and grunt of Shivers fighting, but he paid it no mind. He could only deal with what was in front of him. You have to be realistic about these things. He shuffled back, showing weariness that was only half-feigned. Then, as the first of them came on, he gritted his teeth and leapt forward, cut him across the face and sent him screaming, hand clasped to his eyes. Logan stumbled into another and got barged in the chest with a shield, its rim catching him under the chin and making him bite his tongue. Logan nearly tripped over the sprawled-out corpse of a dead Carl, righted himself just in time, flailed with his sword, and hit nothing, reeled after it, and felt something cut into his leg as he went. He gasped and hopped, waving the sword around, all off balance. 
He lunged at some moving fur, his leg gave under him, and he piled into someone. They fell together, and Logan's head cracked against the stone. They rolled, and Logan struggled up on top, shouting and drooling, tangled his fingers in an Easterner's greasy hair, and smashed his face into the stone, again and again, until his skull went soft. He dragged himself away, heard a blade clang against the walkway where he'd been, hauled himself up to his knees, sword loose in one sticky hand. He knelt there, water running down his face, dragging in air. More of them coming at him and nowhere to go. His leg was hurting, no strength in his arms. His head felt light, like it might float away. No strength left to fight with, hardly. More of them coming at him, one at the front with thick leather gloves, a big maul in his hands, its heavy spiked head red with blood. Looked like he'd already broken one skull with it, and Logan's would be next. Then Bethod would have won at last. Logan felt a cold feeling stab at his gut, a hard, empty feeling. His knuckles clicked as the muscles in his hand went rigid, gripping the sword painful tight. No, he hissed. No, no, no. But he might as well have said no to the rain. That cold feeling spread out, up through Logan's face, tugging his mouth into a bloody smile. Gloves came closer, his maul scraping against the wet stone. He glanced over his shoulder. His head came apart, spraying out blood. Crummicky Fail roared like an angry bear, finger bones flying round his neck, his great hammer whirling round and round his head in huge circles. The next Easterner tried to back away, holding up his shield. Crummock's hammer swung two-handed, ripped his legs out from under him, sent him tumbling over and over onto his face on the stone. The big hillman sprang up onto the walkway, nimble as a dancer for all his great bulk, caught the next man a blow in the stomach that hurled him through the air and left him crumpled against the battlements. Logan watched one set of savages murdering another, breathing hard as Crummock's boys whooped and screamed, paint on their faces smeared in the rain. They flooded up onto the wall, hacking at the Easterners with their rough swords and their bright axes, driving them back and shoving their ladders away, flinging their bodies over the parapet and into the mud below. He knelt there in a puddle, leaning on the cold grip of Canadius's sword, its point dug into the stone walkway. He bent over and breathed hard, his cold gut sucking in and out, his raw mouth salty, his nose full of the stink of blood. He hardly dared to look up. He clenched his teeth and closed his eyes and hawked sour spit up onto the stones. He forced that cold feeling in his stomach down, and it slunk away, for now at least, and left him with only pain and weariness to worry about. Looks like those bastards had enough! came Crummock's laughing voice from out of the drizzle. The hillman tipped his head back, mouth open, stuck his tongue out into the rain, then licked his lips. How is some good work you put in today, bloody nine? Not that it ain't my special pleasure to watch you at it, but I'm glad to get my share. He hefted his great long hammer up in one hand and spun it round as if it was a willow switch peering at a great bloody stain on the head with a clump of hair stuck to it, then grinning wide. Logan looked up at him, hardly enough strength left to lift his head. Oh, aye. Good work. We'll go at the back tomorrow, though, eh? Since you're that keen, you can take the fucking wall. The rain was slacking, down to a thin spit and drizzle. A glimmer of fading sunlight broke through the sagging clouds, bringing Bethod's camp back into view, his muddy ditch and his standards, tents scattered across the valley. Dogman squinted, thought he could see a few men stood around the front watching the Easterners run back, a glint of sunlight on something. An eyeglass, maybe, like the Union used, usually to look the wrong way. Dogman wondered if it was Bethod down there, watching it all happen. It would be just like Bethod to have got himself an eyeglass. He felt a big hand clap him on the shoulder. 
We gave him a slap, chief, rumbled Tull, and a good un. There was small doubt of that. There were a lot of dead Easterners scattered in the mud round the base of that wall, a lot of wounded carried by their mates or dragging themselves slow and painful back towards their lines. But there were a fair few killed on their side of the wall as well. Dogman could see a stack of muddy corpses over near the back of the fortress where they were doing the burying. He could hear someone screaming, hard and nasty screams, the kind a man makes when he needs a limb taken off, or he's had one off already. We gave him a slap, I, Dogman muttered. But they gave us one as well. I'm not sure how many slaps will stand. The barrels that carried their arrows were no more than half full now, the rocks close to run out. Best send some boys to pick over the dead, he shouted to the men over his shoulder. Get what we can, while we can. Can't have too many arrows at a time like this, said Tull. Number of those crinna bastards we killed today. I reckon we'll have more spears tonight than we had this morning. Dogman managed to put a grin on his face. Nice of them to bring us something to fight with. Aye, reckon they'd get bored right quick if we ran out of arrows, Tull laughed, and he clapped the dogman on the back harder than ever hard enough to make his teeth rattle. We did well. You did well. We're still alive, ain't we? Some of us are. Dogman looked down at the corpse of the one man who died up on the tower. An old boy, hair mostly grey, a rough-made arrow in his neck. Bad luck, that had been, to catch a shaft on a day as wet as today, but you're sure to get a measure of luck in a fight, both good and bad. He frowned down into the darkening valley. Where the hell are the Union at? At least the rain had stopped. You have to be grateful for the small things in life, like some smoky kind of a fire after the wet. You have to be grateful for the small things when any minute might be your last. Logan sat alone beside his scrub of a flame and rubbed gently at his right palm. It was sore, pink, stiff from gripping the rough hilt of the maker's sword all the day long, blistered round the joints of his fingers. His head was bruised all over. The cut on his leg was burning some, but he could still walk well enough. He could have ended up a lot worse. There were more than three score buried now, and they were putting them in pits for a dozen each, just as Crummer had said they would. Three score and more gone back to the mud, and twice that many hurt, a lot of them bad. Over by the big fire, he could hear Dow growling about how he'd stabbed some Easterner in the fruits. He could hear Tull's rumbling laughter. Logan hardly felt like a part of it any more. Maybe he never had been. A set of men he'd fought and beaten. Lives he'd spared, for no reason that made sense. Men who'd hated him worse than death but been bound to follow. Hardly more his friends than Shivers was. Perhaps the dogman was his only true friend in all the wide circle of the world. And even in his eyes, from time to time, Logan thought he could see that old trace of doubt, that old trace of fear. He wondered if he could see it now, as the dogman came up out of the darkness. You think they'll come tonight? he asked. He'll give it a go in the dark sooner or later, said Logan. But my guess is he'll leave it till we're a bit more worn down. You get more worn down than this? I guess we'll find out. Logan grimaced as he stretched out his aching legs. It really seems like this shit used to be easier. Dogman gave a snort, not a laugh really, more just letting Logan know he'd heard. Memory can work some magic. You remember Carleon? Of course I do. Logan looked down at his missing finger, and he bunched his fist so it looked the same as it always had. Strange how it all seemed so simple back in them days. Who you fought for and why. Can't say it ever bothered me. It bothered me, said Dogman. It did? You should have said something. Would you have listened? No, I guess not. 
They sat there for a minute in silence. You reckon we'll live through this? asked the dogman. Maybe, if the Union turns up tomorrow, or the day after. You think they will? Maybe. We can hope. Hoping for a thing don't make it happen. The opposite, usually. But every day we're still alive is a chance. Maybe this time it'll work. Dogman frowned at the shifting flames. That's a lot of maybes. That's war. Who'd have thought we'd be relying on a bunch of Southerners to solve our problems for us, eh? I reckon you solve them any way you can. You have to be realistic. Being realistic, then. You reckon we'll live through this? Logan thought about it for a while. Maybe. Boots squelched in the soft earth, and Shivers walked up quiet towards the fire. There was a grey bandage wrapped round his head where he'd taken that cut, and his hair hung down damp and greasy from under it. Chief, he said. Dogman smiled as he got up and clapped him on the shoulder. All right, Shivers. That was good work today. I'm glad you came over, lad. We all are. He gave Logan a long look. All of us. Think I might try and get a rest for a minute. I'll see you boys when they come again. Most likely it'll be soon enough. He walked off into the night and left Shivers and Logan staring one at the other. Probably Logan should have got his hand near to a knife, watched for sudden moves and all the rest. But he was too tired and too sore for it. So he just sat there and watched. Shivers pressed his lips together, squatting down beside the fire opposite, slow and reluctant, as if he was about to eat something he knew was rotten but had no choice. If I'd have been in your place, he said after a while, I would have let those bastards kill me today. A few years ago, I'm sure I would have. What changed? Logan frowned as he thought about it. Then he shrugged his aching shoulders. I'm trying to be better than I was. You think that's enough? What else can I do? Shivers frowned at the fire. I wanted to say... He worked the words around in his mouth and spat them out. Then I'm grateful, I guess. You saved my life today. I know it. He wasn't happy about saying it, and Logan knew why. It's hard to be done a favor by a man you hate. It's hard to hate him so much afterwards. Losing an enemy can be worse than losing a friend, if you've had him for long enough. So Logan shrugged again. It's nothing. What a man should do for his crew, that's all. I owe you a lot more, I know that. I can never pay what I owe you. No, but it's some kind of start at it, as far as I'm concerned. Shivers got up and took a step away. Then he stopped and turned back, firelight shifting over one side of his hard, angry face. It ain't ever as simple, is it, as a man is just good or bad? Not even you. Not even Bethod. Not anybody. No. Logan sat and watched the flames moving. No, it ain't ever that simple. We all got our reasons, good men and bad men. It's all a matter of where you stand. Chapter 26 The Perfect Couple one of Giselle's countless footmen perched on the stepladder and lowered the crown with frowning precision onto his head, its single enormous diamond flashing pricelessly bright. He gave it the very slightest twist back and forth, the fur-trimmed rim gripping Giselle's skull. He climbed back down, whisked the stepladder away, and surveyed the result. So did half a dozen of his fellows. One of them stepped forward to tweak the precise positioning of Giselle's gold-embroidered sleeve. Another grimaced as he flicked an infinitesimal speck of dust from his pure white collar. Very good, said Baez, nodding thoughtfully to himself. I believe that you are ready for your wedding. The peculiar thing 
now that Giselle had a rare moment to think about it, was that he had not, in any way of which he was aware, agreed to get married. He had neither proposed nor accepted a proposal. He had never actually said yes to anything. And yet, here he was, preparing to be joined in matrimony in a few short hours and to a woman he scarcely knew at all. It had not escaped his notice that in order to have been managed so quickly, the arrangements must have been well under way before Baez had even suggested the notion. Perhaps before Giselle had even been crowned. But he supposed it was not so very surprising. Since his enthronement, he had drifted helplessly through one incomprehensible event after another, like a man shipwrecked and struggling to keep his head above water out of sight of land, dragged who knew where by unseen, irresistible currents, but considerably better dressed. He was gradually starting to realize that the more powerful a man became, the fewer choices he really had. Captain Giselle Dan Luthar had been able to eat what he liked, to sleep when he liked, to see who he liked. His august majesty, King Giselle I, on the other hand, was bound by invisible chains of tradition, expectation, and responsibility that prescribed every aspect of his existence, however small. Baez took a discerning step forward. Perhaps the top button undone here? Giselle jerked away with some annoyance. The attention of the Magus to every tiny detail of his life was becoming more than tiresome. It seemed that he could scarcely use the latrine without the old bastard poking through the results. I know how to button a coat, he snapped. Should I expect to find you here tonight, when I bring my new wife to our bedchamber, ready to instruct me on how best to use my prick? The footman coughed and averted their eyes and scraped away towards the corners of the room. Baez himself neither smiled nor frowned. I stand always ready to advise your majesty, but I had hoped that might be one item of business you could manage alone. I hope you're well prepared for our little outing. I've been getting ready all morning. Ardy froze when she looked up and saw Glockter's face. What happened to you? What, this? He waved his hand at the mottled mass of bruises. A cantic woman broke into my apartment in the night, punched me repeatedly, and near drowned me in the bath. An experience I would not recommend. Evidently, she did not believe him. Now, what really happened? I fell down the stairs. Ah, stairs. They can be brutal bastards when you're not that firm on your feet. She stared at her half-full glass, her eyes slightly misty. Are you drunk? It's the afternoon, isn't it? I try always to be drunk by now. Once you start a job, you should give it your best. Or so my father liked to tell me. Glockter narrowed his eyes at her, and she stared back evenly over the rim of her glass. No trembling lip, no tragic face, no streaks of bitter tears down the cheek. She seemed no less happy than usual. Or no more unhappy, perhaps. But Giselle Dan Luther's wedding day can be no joyous occasion for her. No one appreciates being jilted, whatever the circumstances. No one enjoys being abandoned. We need not go, you know. Glockter winced as he tried unsuccessfully to stretch some movement into his wasted leg, and the wince itself caused a ripple of pain through his split lips and across his battered face. I certainly won't complain if I do not have to walk another step today. We can sit here and talk of rubbish and politics. And miss the king's marriage? gasped Ardy, one hand pressed to her chest in fake horror. But I really must see what the Princess Therese is wearing. They say she is the most beautiful woman in the world, and even scum like me must have someone to look up to. She tipped back her head and swilled down the last of her wine. Having fucked the groom is really no excuse for missing a wedding, you know.
The flagship of Grand Duke Orso of Tallinn's ploughed slowly, deliberately, majestically forwards, under no more than quarter sail, a host of seabirds flapping and calling in the rich blue sky above. It was by far the largest ship that Giselle, or anyone amongst the vast crowds that lined the quay and crammed the roofs and windows of the buildings along the waterfront, had ever laid eyes upon. It was decked out in its finest, coloured bunting fluttered from the rigging, and its three towering masts were hung with bright flags, the sable cross of Talons and the golden sun of the Union, side by side in honour of the happy occasion. But it looked no less menacing for that. It looked as Logan Nine Fingers might have in a dandy's jacket, unmistakably still a man of war and appearing more savage rather than less for the gaudy finery in which it was plainly uncomfortable. As the means of bringing a single woman to Adua, and that woman Giselle's bride-to-be, this mighty vessel was anything but reassuring. It implied that Grand Duke Orso might be an intimidating presence as a father-in-law. Giselle saw sailors now, crawling among the myriad ropes like ants through a bush, bringing the acres of sailcloth in with well-practiced speed. They let the mighty ship plough forward under its own momentum, its vast shadow falling over the quay and plunging half the welcoming party into darkness. It slowed, the air full of the creaking of timbers and hawsers. It came to a deliberate stop, dwarfing the now tiny-seeming boats meekly tethered to either side as a tiger might dwarf kittens. The golden figurehead, a woman twice life-size, thrusting a spear towards the heavens, glittered menacingly far over Giselle's head. A huge wharf had been specially constructed in the middle of the quay where the draft was at its deepest. Down this gently sloping ramp, the royal party of Talons descended into Adua, like visitors from a distant star, where everyone was rich, beautiful, and obliviously happy. To either side marched a row of bearded guardsmen, all dressed in identical black uniforms, their helmets polished to a painful pitch of mirror brightness. Between them, in two rows of six, came a dozen ladies-in-waiting, each one arrayed in red or blue or vivid purple silks, each one as splendid as a queen herself. But not one of the awestruck multitude on the waterfront could have been in any doubt who was the centre of attention. The Princess Therese glided along at the fore, tall, slender, impossibly regal, as graceful as a circus dancer and as stately as an empress of legend. Her pure white gown was stitched with glittering gold. Her shimmering hair was the colour of polished bronze. A chain of daunting diamonds flashed and sparkled on her pale chest in the bright sunlight. The Jewel of Talons seemed at that moment an apt name indeed. Therese looked as pure and dazzling, as proud and brilliant, as hard and beautiful as a flawless gemstone. As her feet touched the stones, the crowds burst out into a tumultuous cheer, and flower petals began to fall in well-orchestrated cascades from the windows of the buildings high above. So it was that she advanced on Giselle with magnificent dignity, her head held imperiously high, her hands clasped proudly before her, over a soft carpet and through a sweet-smelling haze of fluttering pink and red. To call it a breathtaking entrance would have been understatement of an epic order. Your august majesty, she murmured, somehow managing to make him feel like the humble one as she curtsied, and behind her the ladies followed suit and the guardsmen bowed low, all with impeccable coordination. My father, the Grand Duke Orso of Talents, sends his profound apologies and she rose up perfectly erect again, as though hoisted by invisible strings. But urgent business in Styria prevents him from attending our wedding. You are all we need, 
croaked Giselle, cursing silently a moment later as he realized he had completely ignored the proper form of address. It was somewhat difficult to think clearly under the circumstances. Therese was even more breathtaking now than when he had last seen her a year or more ago, arguing savagely with Prince Ladislaw at the feast held in his honor. The memory of her vicious shrieking did little to encourage him, but then Giselle would hardly have been delighted by the prospect of marrying Ladisla himself. After all, the man had been a complete ass. Giselle was an entirely different sort of person and could no doubt expect a different response. So he hoped. Please, your highness. And he held out his hand to her. She rested hers on it, seeming to weigh less than a feather. Your majesty does me too much honor. The hooves of the gray horses crackled on the paving, the carriage wheels whirred smoothly. They set off up the king's way, a company of knights of the body riding in tight formation around them, arms and armor glinting, each stride of the great thoroughfare lined with appreciative commoners, each door and window filled with smiling subjects all there to cheer for their new king and for the woman soon to be their queen. Giselle knew he must look an utter idiot next to her, a clumsy, low-born, ill-mannered oaf who had not the slightest right to share her carriage, unless perhaps she was using him as a footrest. He had never in his life felt truly inferior before. He could scarcely believe that he was marrying this woman, today. His hands were shaking, positively shaking. Perhaps some heartfelt words might help them both relax. Therese, she continued to wave imperiously to the crowds, I realize that we do not know each other in the least, but I would like to know you. The slightest twitch of her mouth was the only sign that she had heard him. I know that this must have come as a terrible shock to you, just as it has to me. I hope, if there is anything I can do to make it easier, that my father feels the interests of my country are best served by this marriage, and it is a daughter's place to obey. Those of us born to high station are long prepared to make sacrifices. Her perfect head turned smoothly on her perfect neck, and she smiled. A smile slightly forced, perhaps, but no less radiant for that. It was hard to believe that a face so smooth and flawless could be made of meat like everybody else's. It seemed like porcelain or polished stone. It was a constant, magical delight to see it move. He wondered if her lips were cool or warm. He would have liked very much to find out. She leaned close to him and placed her hand gently on the back of his. Warm, undoubtedly warm, and soft, and very much made of flesh. You really should wave, she murmured, her voice full of Styrian song. Uh, yes, he croaked, his mouth very dry. Yes, of course. Glockter stood, Ardy beside him, and frowned at the doors of the Lord's Round. Beyond those towering gates, in the great circular hall, the ceremony was taking place. Oh, joyous, joyous day! High Justice Morovia's wise exhortations would be echoing from the gilded dome, the happy couple would be speaking their solemn vows with light hearts. Only the lucky few had been allowed within to bear witness. The rest of us must worship from afar. And quite a crowd had gathered to do just that. The wide square of marshals was choked with them. Glockter's ears were stuffed with their excited babbling. A sycophantic throng, all eager for their divine majesties to emerge. He rocked impatiently back and forth, from side to side, grimacing and hissing, trying to get the blood to flow in his aching legs, the cramps to be still. But standing in one place for this length of time is, to put it simply, torture. How long can a wedding take? 
Adi raised one dark eyebrow. Perhaps they couldn't keep their hands off each other and are busy consummating the marriage right there on the floor of the Lord's Round. How bloody long can a consummation take? Lean on me if you need to, she said, holding out her elbow to him. The cripple, using the drunk for the port, Glockter frowned. We make quite the couple. Fall over, if you prefer, and knock out the rest of your teeth. I'll lose no sleep over it. Perhaps I should take her up on the offer, if only for a moment. After all, where's the harm? But then the first shrill cheers began to float up, soon joined by more and more, until a jubilant roar was making the air throb. The doors of the Lord's Round were finally being heaved open, and the High King and Queen of the Union emerged into the bright sunlight, hand in hand. Even Glockter was forced to admit that they made a dazzling pair. Like monarchs of myth, they stood arrayed in brilliant white, trimmed with twinkling embroidery, matching golden suns across the back of her long gown and his long coat, glittering as they turned to the crowds. Each tall and slender and graceful, each crowned with shining gold and a single flashing diamond. Both so very young and so very beautiful, and with all their happy, rich and powerful lives ahead of them. Hurrah! Hurrah for them! My shriveled turd of a heart bursts open with joy. Glockter rested his hand on Ardy's elbow, and he leaned towards her, and he smiled his most twisted, toothless, grotesque grin. Is it really true that our king is more handsome than I? Offensive nonsense! She thrust out her chest and tossed her head giving Glockter a withering sneer down her nose. And I sparkle more brightly than the jewel of Talons. Oh, you do, my dear, you absolutely do. We make them look like beggars, like scum, like cripples. They chuckled together as the royal pair swept majestically across the square, accompanied by a score of watchful knights of the body. The closed council followed behind at a respectful distance, eleven stately old men, with Baez among them in his arcane vestments, smiling almost as wide as the glorious couple themselves. I didn't even like him, muttered Ardy under her breath, to begin with. Not really. That certainly makes two of us. No need to weep. You're far too sharp to have been satisfied with a dullard like him. She breathed in sharply. I'm sure you're right, but I was so bored and lonely and tired. And drunk, no doubt. She shrugged her shoulders hopelessly. He made me feel like I was something more than a burden. He made me feel... wanted. And what makes you suppose that I want to know about it? Wanted, you say. How wonderful. And now? She looked miserably down at the ground, and Glockter felt just the smallest trace of guilt. But guilt only really hurts when there's nothing else to worry about. It was hardly as if it was true love. He saw the thin sinews in her neck moving as she swallowed. But somehow, I always thought it would be me making a fool of him. Ha! <laughs> How rarely any of us get what we expect. The royal party processed gradually out of view, the last splendid courtiers and shining bodyguards tramping after them, the sound of rapturous applause creeping off towards the palace. Towards their glorious futures, and we guilty secrets are by no means invited. Here we stand, murmured Ardy, the offcuts the wretched leavings, the rotten stalks. I wouldn't worry over much. Glockter gave a sigh. You are still young, clever, and passably pretty. Epic praise indeed. You have all your teeth and both your legs, 
a marked advantage over some of us, I do not doubt that you will soon find some other high-born idiot to entrap, and no harm done. She turned away from him and hunched her shoulders, and he guessed that she was biting her lip. He winced and lifted his hand to lay it on her shoulder, the same hand that cut Sep Dan Teufel's fingers into slices, that pinched the nipples from Inquisitor Harker's chest, that carved one gurkish emissary into pieces and burned another, that sent innocent men to rot in Angland, and so on and so on. He jerked it back and let it fall. Better to cry all the tears in the world than be touched by that hand. Comfort comes from other sources and flows to other destinations. He frowned out across the square and left Ardy to her misery. The crowd cheered on. It was a magnificent event, of course. No effort or expense had been spared. Giselle would not have been at all surprised if he had five hundred guests, and no more than a dozen of them known to himself in any significant degree. The lords and ladies of the Union, the great men of closed and open councils, the richest and the most powerful, dressed in their best and on their best behavior. The Chamber of Mirrors was a fitting venue, the most spectacular room in the entire palace, as big as a battlefield, and made to seem larger yet by the great mirrors which covered every wall, creating the disconcerting impression of dozens of other magnificent weddings in dozens of other adjoining ballrooms. A multitude of candles flickered and waved on the tables and in the sconces and among the crystal chandeliers high above. Their soft light shone on the silverware, glittered on the jewels of the guests, and was reflected back from the dark walls gleaming into the far dim distance. A million points of light, like the stars in a dark night sky. A dozen of the Union's finest musicians played subtle and entrancing music, and it mingled with the swell of satisfied chatter, the clink and rattle of old money and new cutlery. It was a joyous celebration, the evening of a lifetime, for the guests. For Giselle, it was something else, and he was not sure what. He sat at a gilded table with his queen beside him, the two of them outnumbered ten to one by fawning servants, displayed to the full view of the whole assembly as though they were a pair of prize exhibits in a zoo. Giselle sat in a haze of awkwardness, in a dreamlike silence, startling from time to time like a sick rabbit as a powdered footman blindsided him with vegetables. Therese sat on his right, occasionally spearing the slightest morsel with a discerning fork, lifting it, chewing it, swallowing it with elegant precision. Giselle had never thought that it was possible to eat beautifully. He now realized his mistake. He could scarcely remember the ringing words of the High Justice that, had he supposed, bound the two of them irrevocably together. Something about love and the security of the nation, he vaguely recalled. But he could see the ring that he had handed numbly to Therese in the Lord's Round, its enormous blood-red stone glittering on her long middle finger. He chewed at a slice of the finest meat, and it tasted like mud in his mouth. They were man and wife. He saw now that Baez had been right, as always. The people longed for something effortlessly higher than themselves. They might not all have had the king they would have asked for, but no one could possibly deny that Therese was all a queen should be and more. The mere idea of Ardy West sitting in that gilded chair was absurd. And yet, Giselle felt a pang of guilt when the idea occurred, closely followed by a greater one of sadness. It would have been a comfort to have someone to talk to then. He gave a painful sigh. If he was to spend his life with this woman, they would have to speak. The sooner they began, he supposed, the better. I hear that Talens is a most beautiful city. Indeed, she said with careful formality. 
But Adua has its sights also? She paused and looked down unhopefully at her plate. Giselle cleared his throat. This is somewhat difficult to adjust to. He ventured a fraction of a smile. She blinked and looked out at the room. It is. Do you dance? She turned her head smoothly to look at him without the slightest apparent movement of her shoulders. A little. He pushed back his chair and stood up. Then, shall we, Your Majesty? As you wish, Your Majesty. As they made their way towards the middle of the wide floor, the chatter gradually diminished. The chamber of mirrors grew deathly quiet, aside from the clicking of his polished boots and her polished shoes on the glistening stone. Giselle swallowed as they took their places, surrounded on three sides by the long tables and the legions of magnificent guests all watching. He had rather that same feeling of breathless anticipation, of fear and excitement, that he had used to have when he stepped into the fencing circle against an unknown opponent before the roaring crowd. They stood still as statues, looking into each other's eyes. He held out his hand, palm up. She reached out, but instead of taking it, she pressed the back of her hand firmly against the back of his and pushed it up so that their fingers were level. She lifted one eyebrow by the slightest margin, a silent challenge that no one else in the hall could possibly have seen. The first long-drawn-out note sobbed from the strings and echoed around the chamber. They set off, circling each other with exaggerated slowness, the golden hem of Teresa's dress swishing across the floor, her feet out of sight so that she appeared to glide rather than take steps, her chin held painfully high. They moved first one way and then the other, and in the mirrors around them a thousand other couples moved in time, stretching away into the shadowy distance, crowned and dressed in flawless white and gold. As the second phrase began and other instruments joined in, Giselle began to realize that he was utterly outclassed, worse than ever he had been by Bremer dan Gorst. Therese moved with such immaculate poise that he was sure she could have balanced a glass of wine on her head without spilling a drop. The music grew louder, faster, bolder, and Therese's movements came faster and bolder with it. It seemed as if she somehow controlled the musicians with her outstretched hands. The two were linked so perfectly. He tried to steer her, and she stepped effortlessly around him. She fainted one way and whirled the other, and Giselle almost went over on his ass. She dodged and spun with masterful disguise and left him lunging at nothing. The music grew faster yet. The musicians soared and plucked with furious concentration. Giselle made a vain attempt to catch her, but Therese twisted away, dazzling him with a flurry of skirts that he could barely follow. She almost tripped him with a foot which was gone before he knew it, tossed her head, and almost stabbed him in the eye with her crown. The great and good of the union looked on in enchanted silence. Even Giselle found himself a dumbstruck spectator. It was the most he could do to remain in roughly the right positions to be made an utter fool of. He was not sure whether he was relieved or disappointed when the music slowed again and she offered out her hand as though it were a rare treasure. He pressed the back of his against it and they circled each other, drawing closer and closer. As the last refrain wept from the instruments, she pressed herself against him, her back to his chest. Slowly they turned, and slower still, his nose full of the smell of her hair. At the last long note, she sank back, and he lowered her gently, her neck stretching out, her head dropping, her delicate crown almost brushing the floor. And there was silence. The room broke into rapturous applause, but Giselle hardly heard them. He was too busy staring at his wife. There was a faint color to her cheek now her lips slightly parted, exposing flawless front teeth, and the lines of her jaw and stretched-out neck and slender collarbones were etched with shadow and ringed with sparkling diamonds. 
Lower down, her chest rose and fell imperiously in her bodice with her rapid breathing, the slightest fascinating sheen of sweat nestling in her cleavage. Giselle would have very much liked to nestle there himself. He blinked, his own breath sharp in his throat. If it please your majesty, she murmured. Eh? Oh, of course. He whisked her back to her feet as the applause continued. You dance magnificently. Your majesty is too kind, she replied, with the barest fragment of a smile, but a smile nonetheless. He beamed gormlessly back at her. His fear and confusion had, in the space of a single dance, smoothly transformed into a most pleasurable excitement. He had been gifted a glimpse beneath the icy shell, and plainly his new queen was a woman of rare and fiery passion. A hidden side to her that he was now greatly looking forward to investigating further looking forward so sharply, in fact, that he was forced to avert his eyes and stare off into the corner, frowning and trying desperately to think of other things, lest the tightness of his trousers caused him to embarrass himself in front of the assembled guests. The sight of Baez grinning in the corner was for once just what he needed to see, the old man's cold smile cooling his ardor as surely as a bucket of iced water. Glockter had left Ardy in her over-furnished living room, making every effort to get even more drunk, and ever since he had found himself in a black mood. Even for me, there's nothing like the company of someone even more wretched than yourself to make you feel better. Trouble is, take their misery away, and your own presses in twice as cold and dreary behind it. He slurped another half-mouthful of gritty soup from his spoon, grimaced as he forced the over-salty slop down his throat. I wonder how wonderful a time King Giselle is enjoying now, lauded and admired by all, gorging himself on the best food and the best company. He dropped the spoon into the bowl, his left eye twitching, and winced at a ripple of pain through his back and down into his leg. Eight years since the Gurkish released me, yet I am still their prisoner and always will be, trapped in a cell no bigger than my own crippled body. The door creaked open, and Barnum shuffled in to collect the bowl. Glockter looked from the half-dead soup to the half-dead old man. The best food and the best company. He would have laughed if his split lips had allowed it. Finished, sir? asked the servant. More than likely. I have been unable to pull the means of destroying Byers out of my ass, and so, of course, his eminence will not be pleased. How displeased can he get, do we suppose, before he loses patience entirely? But what can be done? Barnum carried the bowl from the room, pulled the door shut behind him, and left Glockter alone with his pain. What is it that I did to deserve this? And what is it that Luther did? Is he not just as I was? Arrogant, vain, and selfish as hell? Is he a better man? Then why has life punished me so harshly and rewarded him so richly? But Glockter already knew the answer. The same reason that innocent Septan Teufel languishes in Angland with his fingers shortened. The same reason that loyal General Visbrook died in Degoska, while treacherous Magister Ida was let live. The same reason that Tolkis, the Gurkish ambassador, was butchered in front of a howling crowd for a crime he did not commit. He pressed his sore tongue into one of his few remaining teeth. Life is not fair. Giselle pranced down the hallway in a dream, but no longer the panicked nightmare of the morning. His head was spinning from praise and applause and approval. His body was glowing with dancing and wine and, increasingly, lust.
with Therese beside him, for the first time in his brief reign, he truly felt like a king. Gems and metal, silk and embroidery, and pale, smooth skin all shone excitingly in the soft candlelight. The evening had turned out to be a delight, and the night promised only to be better yet. Therese might have seemed as hard as a jewel from a distance, but Giselle had held her in his arms, and he knew better. The great panelled doors of the royal bedchamber were held open by a pair of cringing footmen, then shut silently as the king and queen of the Union swept past. The mighty bed dominated the far side of the room, sprays of tall feathers at the corners of its canopy casting long shadows up onto the gilded ceiling. Its rich green curtains hung invitingly wide, the silken space beyond filled with soft and tantalizing shadows. Therese took a few slow steps into the chamber ahead of him, her head bowed, while Giselle turned the key in the lock with a long, smooth rattling of warts. His breath came fast as he stepped up behind his wife, lifted his hand, and placed it gently on her bare shoulder. He felt the muscles stiffen under her smooth skin, smiled at her nervousness, matching his own so closely. He wondered if he should say something to try and calm her, but what would have been the purpose? They both knew what had to happen now, and Giselle, for one, was impatient to begin. He came closer, slipping his free hand around her waist, feeling his palm hiss over rough silk. He brushed the nape of her neck with his lips, once, twice, three times. He nuzzled against her hair, dragging in her fragrance and breathing it out softly against the side of her face. He felt her tremble at his breath upon her skin, but that only encouraged him. He slid his fingers over her shoulder and across her chest, her diamonds trailing over the back of his hand as he slipped it down into her bodice. He moved up closer yet, pressing himself against her, making a satisfied growl in his throat, his prick nudging pleasantly into her backside through their clothes. In a moment, she had torn away from him with a gasp, spun around, and slapped him across the face with a smack that set his head ringing. You filthy bastard! she shrieked in his face, spit flying from her twisted mouth. You son of a fucking whore! How dare you touch me! Ladislaw was a cretin, but at least his blood was clean! Giselle gaped, one hand pressed against his burning face, his whole body rigid with shock. He reached out feebly with his other hand. But I... Oof. Her knee caught him between the legs with pitiless accuracy, driving the wind from his chest, making him teeter for a breathless moment, then bringing him down like a sledgehammer to a house of cards. As he slid groaning to the carpet, in that special shooting agony that only a blow to the fruits can produce, it was little consolation that he had been right. His queen was quite evidently a woman of rare and fiery passion. The tears flowing so liberally from his eyes were not just of pain and awful surprise and temporary disappointment, they were increasingly of deepening horror. It seemed that he had misjudged Therese's feelings most seriously. She had smiled for the crowds, but now, in private, she gave every indication of despising him and all he stood for. The fact that he had been born a bastard was hardly something he could ever change. For all he knew, his wedding night was about to be spent on the royal floor. The queen had already hurried across the room, and the curtains of the bed were tightly drawn against him. Chapter 27 The Seventh Day The Easterners had come again last night, crept up by darkness, found a spot to climb in, and killed a sentry. Then they'd set a ladder, and a crowd of them had sneaked inside by the time they were found out. The cries had woken the dogman, hardly sleeping anyway, and he'd scrabbled awake in the black, all tangled with his blanket. Enemies inside the fortress, men running and shouting, shadows in the dark, everything reeking of panic and chaos. 
men fighting by starlight and by torchlight and by no light at all, blades swung with hardly a notion of where they were headed, boots stumbling and kicking showers of bright sparks out of the guttering campfires. They'd driven them back in the end. They'd herded them to the wall and cut them down in numbers, and only three had lived to drop their weapons and give up. A bad mistake for them, as it turned out. There were a lot of men dead these seven days. Every time the sun went down, there were more graves. No one was in much of a merciful mood, providing they'd been suited that way in the first place, and not many had. So when they'd caught these three, Black Dow had trussed them up on the wall where Bethod and all the rest could see. Trussed them up in the hard blue dawn, first streaks of light just stabbing across the black sky, and he'd doused them all with oil and set a spark to them. One by one he'd done it, so the others could see what was coming and set to screaming before their turn. Dogman didn't much take to seeing men on fire. He didn't like hearing their shrieks and their fat crackling. He didn't smile at a noseful of the sick sweet stink of their burning meat. But he didn't think of trying to stop it, neither. There was a time for soft opinions, and this weren't it. Mercy and weakness are the same thing in war, and there's no prizes for nice behavior. He'd learned that from Bethod a long time ago. Maybe now those Easterners would give it a second thought before they came again at night and fucked up everyone's breakfast. Might help to put some steel in the rest of the dogman's crew besides, because more than a few were getting itchy. Some lads had tried to get away two nights before, given up their places and crept over the wall in the darkness, tried to get down into the valley. Bethod had their heads on spears out in front of his ditch now. A dozen battered lumps, hair blowing about in the breeze. You could hardly see their faces from the wall, but it seemed somehow they had an angry, upset sort of a look, like they blamed the dogman for leading them to this, as though he hadn't enough to worry about with the reproaches of the living. He frowned down at Bethod's camp, the shapes of his tents and his signs just starting to come up black out of the mist and the darkness, and he wondered what he could do, except for stand there and wait. All his boys were looking to him, hoping he'd pull some trick of magic to get them out of this alive. But Dogman didn't know any magic. A valley and a wall and no ways out. No ways out had been the whole point of the plan. He wondered if they could stand another day, but then he'd wondered that yesterday morning. What's Bethard planning for today, do we reckon? He murmured to himself. What's he got planned? A massacre, grunted Grimm. Dogman gave him a hard look. Attack is the word I might have picked, but I wouldn't be surprised if we get it your way before the day's out. He narrowed his eyes and stared down into the shadowy valley, hoping to see what he'd been hoping for all the last seven long days. Some sign that the Union were coming. But there was nothing. Below Bethod's wide camp, his tents and his standards and his masses of men, there was nothing but the bare and empty land, mist clinging in the shady hollows. Tull nudged him in the ribs with a great big elbow and managed to make a grin. I don't know about this plan, waiting for the Union and all that. Sounds a bit risky if you ask me. Any chance I can change my mind now? The dogman didn't laugh. He hadn't any laughter left. Not much. No. The giant puffed out a weighty sigh. I don't suppose there is. Seven days since the shanker first came at the walls. Seven days, and it felt like seven months. Logan hardly had a muscle that didn't ache from hard use. He was covered in a legion of bruises, a host of scratches, an army of grazes and knocks and burns. He had the long cut down his leg bandaged, his ribs all bound up tight from getting kicked in them, a pair of good-sized scabs under his hair, his shoulder stiff as wood from where he'd got battered with a shield, his knuckles scraped and swollen from punching at an Easterner and catching stone instead. 
He was one enormous sore spot. The rest of the crowd were little better off. There was hardly a man in the whole fortress without some kind of an injury. Even Crummock's daughter had picked up a scratch from somewhere. One of Shivers's boys had lost himself a finger the day before yesterday. Little one on his left hand. He was looking at it now, wrapped up tight in dirty, bloody cloth, wincing. Burn stone it, he said, looking up at Logan, bunching up the rest of his fingers and opening them again. Logan should have felt sorry for him, probably. He remembered the pain and the disappointment even worse, hardly able to believe that you wouldn't have that finger any more for the whole rest of your life. But he'd got no pity left for anyone beyond himself. It surely does, he grunted. Feels like it's still there. I... Does that feeling go away? In time. How much time? More than we've got, most likely. The man nodded, slow and grim. I... Seven days, and even the cold stone and wet wood of the fortress itself seemed to have had enough. The new parapets were crumbled and sagging, shored up as best they could be, and crumbled again. The gates were chopped to rotten firewood, daylight showing through the hacked-out gaps, boulders piled in behind. A firm knock might have brought them down. A firm knock might have brought Logan down, for that matter, the way he was feeling. He took a mouthful of sour water from his flask. They were getting to the rank stuff at the bottom of the barrels. Low on food, too, and on everything else. Hope, in particular, was in short and dwindling supply. Still alive, he whispered to himself, but there wasn't much triumph in it, even less than usual. Civilization might not have been all to his taste, but a soft bed, a strange place to piss, and a bit of scorn from some skinny idiots didn't seem like such a bad option right then. He was busy asking himself for the thousandth time why he came back at all when he heard Crummocky Fale's voice behind him. Wow, wow, bloody nine. You look tired, man. Logan frowned up. The hillman's mad blather was starting to grate on him. It's been hard work these past days, in case you hadn't noticed. I have, and I've had my part in it, haven't I, my beauties? His three children looked at each other. I, said the girl in a tiny voice. Crummock frowned down at them. Don't like the way the game's played no more, eh? How about you, bloody nine? The moon stopped smiling, has it? You scared, are you? Logan gave the fat bastard a long, hard look. Tired is what I am, Crummock. Tired of your fortress, your food, and most of all, I'm tired of your fucking talk. Not everyone loves the sound of your fat lips flapping as much as you. Why don't you piss off and see if you can fit the moon up your ass? Crummock split a grin a curve of yellow teeth standing out from his brown beard. That's the man I love right there. One of his sons, the one that carried the spear with him, was tugging at his shirt. What the hell is it, boy? What happens if we lose, Dar? If we what? growled Crummock, and he cuffed his son round the head with a great hand and knocked him on his face in the dirt. On your feet! There'll be no losing here, boy. Not while the moon loves us, muttered his sister, but not that loud. Logan watched the lad struggling up, holding a hand to his bloody mouth and looking like he wanted to cry. He knew that feeling. Probably he should have said something about treating a child that way. Maybe he would have on the first day or the second even. Not now. He was too tired and too sore and too scared to care much about it. Black Dow ambled up, something not too far from a smile across his face. The one man in the whole camp who might have been said to be in a better mood than usual. And you know you're in some sorry shit when Black Dow starts smiling. Nine fingers, he grunted. Dow, run out of men to burn, have you? 
Reckon Bethel will be sending me some more presently. He nodded towards the wall. What you think he'll send today? After what we gave him last night, I reckon those crinner bastards are just about done. Bloody savages. I reckon they are at that. And there've been no shanker for a few days now. Four days since he sent the flatheads at us. Logan squinted up at the sky, slowly getting lighter. Looks like good weather today. Good weather for armor and swords and men walking shoulder to shoulder. Good weather to try and finish us. Wouldn't be surprised if he sends the Carls today. Nor me. His best, said Logan, from way back. Wouldn't be surprised to see white sides and goring and pale as snow and fucking little bone and all the rest come strolling up to the gate after breakfast. Dow snorted. His best, right crowd of cunts those. And he turned his head and spat onto the mud. You'll get no argument from me. That's so. Didn't you fight alongside em all those hard and bloody years? I did. But I can't say I ever much liked em. Well, if it's any consolation, I doubt they think too much of you these days. Dow gave him a long look. When did Bethod stop suiting you, eh, Nine Fingers? Logan stared back at him. Hard to say. Bit by bit, I reckon. Maybe he got to be more of a bastard as time went on. Or maybe I got to be less of one. Or maybe there ain't room on one side for two bastards as big as the Peria. Oh, I don't know. Logan got up. You and me work real sweet together. He stalked away from Dow, thinking about what easy work Malachus Kwai and Pharaoh Maljin and even Jazal Dan Luthar had been. Seven days, and they were all at each other's throats, all angry, all tired. Seven days. The one consolation was that there couldn't be many more. They're coming. Dogman's eyes flicked sideways, like most of the few things Grimm said it hardly needed saying. They could all see it as clearly as the sun rising. Bethod's cows were on the move. They were in no hurry. They came on stiff and steady, painted shields held up in front, eyes to the gateway. Standards flapped over their heads. Signs the dogman recognized from way back. He wondered how many of those men down there he'd fought alongside, how many of their faces he could put a name to, how many he'd drunk with, eaten with, laughed with, that he'd have to do his best to put back in the mud. He took a long breath. The battlefield's no place for sentiment. Three trees had told him once, and he'd taken it right to heart. All right. He lifted up his hand as the men around him on the tower readied their bows. Hold on to him for a minute yet. The carls stomped on through the churned-up mud and the broken rocks where the valley narrowed, past the bodies of Easterners and Shanker left twisted where they lay, hacked or crushed or stuck with broken arrows. They didn't falter or lose a step. The wall of shields shifted as they came, but didn't break, not the slightest gap. They march tight, muttered Tull. Aye, too tight, the bastards. They were getting close now, close enough that Dogman had to try some arrows. All right, boys, aim high and let them drop. The first flight went hissing from the tower, arced up high and started to fall on that tight column. They shifted their shields to meet them and arrows thudded into painted wood, spun off helmets and glanced off mail. A couple found marks, a shriek went up, holes showed here or there, but the rest just stepped on over, trudging up towards the wall. Dogman frowned at the barrels where the shafts were kept, less than quarter full now, and most of those dug out from dead men. Careful now, pick your marks, lads. Ah, uh, said Grim, pointing down below. A good-sized pack of men were scurrying out from the ditch, dressed in stiff leather and steel-capped. They formed up in a few neat rows, kneeling down, tending to their weapons. Flat bows, like the Union used. Get down! shouted Dogman. Those nasty little bows rattled and spat, 
Most of the boys on the tower were well behind their parapet by then, but one optimist who'd been leaning out got a bolt through his mouth, swayed and toppled, silent off the tower. Another took one in his chest, breathing with a wheeze like wind through a split pine. All right, give him something back! They all came up at once and sent down a volley, strings humming, peppering those bastards with plunging shafts. Their bows might not have had the same spit to them, but with the height the arrows still came hard and Bethod's archers had nothing to hide behind. More than a few fell back or started crawling away, screaming and squealing, but the rank behind pushed through, slow and steady, knelt down and aimed their flat bows. Another flight of bolts came hissing up. Men ducked and threw themselves down. One zipped right past the dogman's head and clicked off the rock face behind. Pure luck he didn't get pinned with it. A couple of the others were less lucky. One lad was lying on his back, a pair of bolts stuck in his chest, peering down at him and whispering, shit, to himself over and over. Bastards! Let him have it back! Shafts and bolts started flapping up both ways, men shouting and taking aim, all anger and gritted teeth. Steady! shouted Dogman. Steady! But no one hardly heard him. With the extra poke from the height and the cover they had from the walls, didn't take long for Dogman's boys to get the upper hand. Bethod's archers started scrambling back, then a couple dropped their flat bows and made a run for it, one getting a shaft right through his back. The rest started to break for the ditch, leaving their wounded crawling in the mud. Huh? said Grimm again. While they'd been busy trading shafts, the Carls had made it right to the gate, shields up over their heads against the rocks and arrows the hillmen were chucking down. They'd got the ditch filled in a day or two before, and now the column opened up in the middle, and those mailed men moved like they were passing something to the front. Dogman caught a glimpse of it a long, thin tree trunk cut down to use as a ram, branches left on short so men could give it a firm swing. Dogman heard the first tearing crash of it working at their sorry excuse for a gate. Shit, he muttered. Knots of thralls were charging forward now, light-armed and light-armoured, carrying ladders between them, counting on speed to make it to the walls. Plenty fell, pricked with spear or arrow, knocked with rocks. Some of their ladders were pushed back, but they were quick and full of bones and stuck to their task. Soon there were a couple of groups on the walls, while more pressed up the ladders behind, fighting with Crummock's people and getting the better by pure freshness and weight of numbers. Now there was a big crack and the gate went down. Dogman saw that tree trunk swing one last time and cave one door right in. The Carls struggled with the other and heaved it open, a couple of stones bouncing from the shields and spinning away. The front few started pressing forwards through the gate. Shit, said Grim. They're through, breathed the dogman, and he watched Bethod's Carls push on into that narrow gap in a mailed tide, trampling the shattered gates under their heavy boots, dragging the rocks behind out of the way, their bright painted shields up, their bright polished weapons ready. To either side, the thralls swarmed up their ladders and onto the wall, pressing Crummock's hillmen back down the walkways. Like a high river bursting a dam, Bethod's host flowed into the broken fortress, first in a trickle and soon in a flood. I'm going down, snarled Tull, dragging his great long sword out of its sheath. Dogman thought about trying to stop him, but then he just nodded, tired, and watched the Thunderhead charge off down the steps, a few others following. There was no point getting in their way. Seemed like it was fast reaching that time. Time for each man to choose where he'd die. Logan saw them come through the gates, up the ramp and into the fortress. Time seemed to move slow. He saw each design on each shield picked out sharp in the morning sun. Black tree, red bridge, two wolves on green, three horses on yellow. Metal glinted and flashed, shields rim, mails ring, spears point, sword's edge. 
On they came, yelling their battle cries, high and thin, the way they'd done for years. The breath crawled in and out of Logan's nose. The thralls and the hillmen fought on the walls as if they were underwater, their sounds dull and muffled. His palms sweated and tickled and itched as he watched the carls break in. Hardly seemed as if it could be true that he had to charge into those bastards and kill as many as he could. What a damn fool notion! He felt that powerful need, as he always had at times like that, to turn and run. All around he felt the fear of the others, their uncertain shuffling, their edging backwards. A sensible enough instinct, except there was nowhere now to run to. Nowhere except forwards, into the teeth of the enemy, and hoped to drive them out before they could get a foothold. There was nothing to think about. It was their only chance. So Logan lifted the Maker's sword high, and he gave a meaningless scream, and he started running. He heard the shouts around him, felt the men moving with him, the jostling and rattling of weapons. The ground and the wall and the carls he ran at jolted and wobbled. His boots pounded on the earth, his own quick breath hissed and rushed with the wind. He saw the carls hurrying to set their shields, to form a wall, to make ready their spears and their weapons, but they were in a mess after coming through that narrow gate, flustered by the screaming mass of men charging down on them. The war cries died in their throats, and their faces sagged from triumph to shock. A couple at the edges started to have doubts, and they faltered and shuffled back, and then Logan and the rest were on them. He managed to twist around a wobbling spear and land a good hard chop on a shield with all the force of his charge, knock his man sprawling in the mud. Logan hacked at his leg as he tried to get up, and the blade cut through mail and left a long gash in flesh, brought him shrieking down again. Logan swung at another carl, felt the maker's sword squeal against the metal rim of a shield and slide into flesh. A man gurgled, vomited blood down the front of his mail coat. Logan saw an axe thud into a helmet and leave a dent the size of a fist in it. He reeled out of the way of a spear thrust, and it stuck in the ribs of a man beside him. A sword hacked into a shield and sent splinters flying into Logan's eyes. He blinked and dodged, slid in the muck, chopped at an arm as it tore at his coat and felt it break, flapping in its mail sleeve. Eyes rolled in a bloody face. Something shoved him in the back and nearly pushed him onto a sword. There was hardly space to swing. Then there was no space at all. Men crushed in from behind, crushed in through the gate, adding their straining, mindless weight to the press in the center. Logan was squashed in tight, shoulder to shoulder. Men gasped and grunted, dug and elbowed at each other, stabbed with knives and gouged at faces with their fingers. He thought he saw little bone in the press, teeth bared in a snarl, long grey hair straggling out from under a helmet set with whirls of gold, spattered with streaks of red, shouting himself hoarse. Logan tried to press towards him, but the blind currents of battle snatched him away and carried them far apart. He stabbed at someone under a shield rim, winced as he felt something dig into his hip, a long, slow burning, getting worse and worse. He growled as the blade cut, not swung or thrust, just held there while he was squashed up against it. He thrashed with his elbows, with his head, managed to twist away from the pain, felt the wetness of blood down his leg. He found himself with room, got his sword hand free, hacked at a shield, chopped a head open on the backswing, then found himself shoved up against it, his face pressed into warm brains. He saw a shield jerk up out of the corner of his eye. The edge caught him in the throat, under the chin, snapped his head back, and filled his skull with blinding light. Before he knew it, he was rolling, coughing, slithering in the filth down among the boots. He dragged himself nowhere, clutching at dirt, spitting blood, boots squelching and straining in the mud all around him. Crawling through a dark, terrifying, shifting forest of legs, the screams of pain and rage filtering down from above with the flickering light. Feet kicked at him, stomped on him, battered at every part of him. He tried to struggle up, and a boot in the mouth sent him limp again. He rolled over, gasping, 
saw a bearded Carl in the same state, impossible to say which side he was on, trying to push himself up out of the mud. Their eyes met for a moment, then a glinting spear blade shot down from above and stabbed the Carl in the back, once, twice, three times. He went limp, blood gurgling down through his beard. There were bodies all around, on their faces and their sides, lying in amongst the dropped and broken gear, kicked and knocked around like children's dolls, some of them still twitching, clutching, grunting. Logan squawked as a boot squelched down hard on his hand, crushing his fingers into the muck. He fumbled a knife from his belt and started slashing weakly at the leg above it, bloody teeth gritted. Something cracked him in the top of the head and sent him sprawling on his face again. The world was a noisy blur, a painful smear, a mass of feet and anger. He didn't know which way he was facing, which way was up or down. His mouth tasted of metal, thirsty. There was blood in his eyes, mud in his eyes. His head was pounding. He wanted to be sick. Back to the north and get some vengeance. What the fuck had he been thinking? Someone screamed, stuck with a flat bow bolt, but the dog man had no time to worry about him. Whiteside's thralls were up on the wall under the tower, and a few had got around and onto the stairway. They were charging up it now, or as close as they could get to a charge on those narrow steps. Dogman dropped his bow and fumbled his sword out from its sheath, got a knife ready in the other hand. A few of the others took up spears, gathered round the head of the stairway as the thralls came up. Dogman swallowed. He'd never been much for fights like this, toe to toe, no more on the length of an axe from your enemies. He'd rather have kept things to a polite distance— but that didn't seem to be what these bastards had in mind. An awkward kind of a fight started up at the top of the steps, defenders poking with spears, trying to shove the thralls off, them poking back, shoving with shields, trying to get a foothold on the platform at the top, everyone taking care in case they took the long drop right back to the mud. One charged through with a spear, screaming at the top of his lungs, and Grimm shot him in the face, cool as you like, no more than a stride or two distant. He staggered a step or two, bent right over with the flights of the arrows sticking out his mouth and the point out the back of his neck. Then Dogman took the top of his head off with his sword and sent his corpse sprawling. A big thrall with wild red hair leapt up the steps, swinging a big axe, roaring like a madman. He got round a spear and felled an archer with a blow that spattered blood across the rock face, charged on through, folks scattering out of the way. Dogman dithered, trying to look like he was an idiot. Then, when the axe came down, he dodged left and the blade missed him by a whisker. The red-haired thrall stumbled, tired from getting over the wall and up all them steps, most likely. A long way to climb, especially with nothing but your death at the end of it. Dogman kicked hard at the side of his knee and his leg buckled. He yelled as he lurched towards the edge of the stairs. Dogman chopped at him with his sword, caught him a slash across the back, hard enough to send him over the edge. He dropped his axe, screamed as he tumbled through the empty air. Dogman felt something move, turned just in time to see another thrall coming at him from the side. He twisted round and knocked the first sword cut clear, gasped as he felt the second thud cold into his arm, heard his sword clatter out of his limp hand. He jerked away from another swing, tripped, and went down on his back. The thrall came at him, lifting up his sword to finish the job, but before he got more than a stride, Grimm loomed up quick from the side, caught hold of his sword arm, and held it pinned. Dogman scrambled up, taking a hard grip on his knife with his good hand, and stabbed the thrall right in the chest. They stayed there, the three of them, tangled up tight together, still in the midst of all that madness, for as long as it took for the man to die. Then Dogman pulled his knife free, and Grimm let him fall. They'd got the best of it up on the tower, at least for now. There was just one thrall left on his feet, and while the Dogman watched, a couple of his lads herded him up to the parapet and poked him off with spears. There were corpses scattered all about the place. A couple of dozen thralls, maybe half that many of the Dogman's boys. One of them was propped against the cliff face, chest heaving as he breathed, face pasty pale, bloody hands clutched to his slashed guts. 
Dogman's hand wouldn't work right. The fingers dangled useless. He tugged his shirt sleeve up, saw a long gash oozing from his elbow almost all the way to his wrist. His guts gave a heave, and he coughed a bit of burning puke up and spat it out. Wounds on other people you can get used to. Cuts out of your own flesh always have a horror to them. Down below, inside the wall, the fight was joined, and nothing but a boiling, tight-pressed mass. Dogman could hardly tell which men were on which side. He stood frozen, bloody knife clutched in one bloody hand. There were no answers now, no plans. It was every man for himself. If they lived out the day, it would be by luck alone, and he was starting to doubt he had that much luck left. He felt someone tugging at his sleeve. Grim. He followed his pointed finger with his eyes. Beyond Bethod's camp, down in the valley, a great cloud of dust was coming up, a brown haze. Underneath, glittering in the morning sun, the armor of horsemen. His hand clamped tight round Grim's wrist, hope suddenly flickering alive again. Fucking Union, he breathed, hardly daring to believe it. West squinted through his eyeglass, lowered it, and peered up the valley, squinted through it again. You sure? Yes, sir. Jallenhorn's big, honest face was streaked with the dirt of eight days' hard riding. And it looks as if they're still holding out, just barely. General Polder! snapped West. My Lord Marshal? murmured Polder with his newly acquired veneer of sycophancy. Are the cavalry ready to charge? The general blinked. They are not properly deployed, have been riding hard these past days, and would be charging uphill over broken ground and at a strong and determined enemy. They will do as you order, of course, Lord Marshal, but it might be prudent to wait for our infantry to prudence is a luxury. West frowned up towards that innocuous space between the two fells. Attack at once, while the dogman and his northmen still held out. They might enjoy the advantage of surprise and crush Bethod between them, but the cavalry would be charging uphill, men and mounts disorganized and fatigued from hard marching. Or wait for the infantry to arrive, still some hours behind, and mount a well-planned assault. But by then, would the dogman and his friends have been slaughtered to a man? their fortress taken, and Bethod well prepared to meet an attack from one side only. West chewed at his lip, trying to ignore the fact that thousands of lives hung upon his decision. To attack now was the greater risk, but might offer the greater rewards. A chance to finish this war within a bloody hour. They might never again catch the King of the Northmen off guard. What was it that Burr had said to him the night before he died? One cannot be a great leader without a certain ruthlessness. Prepare the charge, and deploy our infantry across the mouth of the valley as soon as they arrive. We must prevent Bethod and any of his forces from escaping. If sacrifices are to be made, I intend that they be meaningful. Polder looked anything but convinced. Will you force me to agree with General Croy's assessment of your fighting qualities, General Polder? Or do you intend to prove the two of us wrong? The general snapped to attention, his moustaches vibrating with new eagerness. Respectfully, sir, to prove you wrong, I will order the charge immediately. He gave his black charger the spurs and flew off up the valley towards the place where the dusty cavalry were massing, pursued by several members of his staff. West shifted in his saddle, chewing worriedly at his lip. His head was beginning to hurt again. A charge uphill against a determined enemy. Colonel Glockter would no doubt have grinned at the prospect of such a deadly gamble. Prince Ladisla would have approved of such cavalier carelessness with other men's lives. Lord Smund would have slapped backs and talked of vim and vigor and called for wine. And only look what became of those three heroes. Logan heard a great roar, faint and far away. Light came at his half-closed eyes, as though the fight was opened up wide. Shadows flickered. A great boot squelched in the filth in front of his face. 
Voices bellowed far above. He felt himself grabbed by the shirt, dragged through the mud, feet and legs thrashing all around him. He saw the sky, painful bright, blinked and dribbled at it. He lay still, limp as a rag. Logan! You all right? Where you hurt? I... he croaked, then started coughing. Do you know me? Something slapped at Logan's face, slapped some sluggish thought into his head. A shaggy shape loomed over him, dark against the bright sky. Logan squinted at it. Tull Duru Thunderhead, unless he was much mistaken. What the hell was he doing here? Thinking was painful. The more Logan sought, the more pain he was in. His jaw was on fire, feeling twice the size it usually did. His every breath was a shuddering, slavering gasp. Above him, the big man's mouth moved, and the words boomed and rang against Logan's ears, but they were nothing but noise. His leg prickled unpleasantly, far away. His own heartbeat leapt and jerked and pounded at his head. He heard sounds, clashing and rattling, coming at him from all sides, and the sounds themselves hurt him, made his jaw burn all the worse, unbearable. Get! The air rasped and clicked, but no sound would come. It wasn't his voice any longer. He reached out with his last strength, and he put his palm against Tull's chest, and he tried to push him away, but the big man only caught his hand and pressed it with his own. It's all right, he growled. I've got you. I, whispered Logan, and the smile spread out across his bloody mouth. He gripped that great hand with a sudden, terrible strength, and with his other fist he found the handle of a knife, tucked down warm against his skin. The good blade darted out, swift as the snake and just as deadly, and sank into the big man's thick neck to the hilt. He looked surprised as the hot blood poured from his open throat, drooled from his open mouth, soaked his heavy beard, dribbled from his nose and down his chest. But he shouldn't have. To touch the bloody nine was to touch death, and death has no favorites and makes no exceptions. The bloody nine rose up, shoving the great corpse away from him, and his red fist closed tight around the giant's sword, a heavy length of star-bright metal, dark and beautiful, a righteous tool for the work that awaited him. So much work. But good work is the best of blessings. The bloody nine opened his mouth and shrieked out all his bottomless love and his endless hate in one long wail. The ground rushed underneath him, and the heaving, writhing, beautiful battle reached out and took him in its soft embrace, and he was home. The faces of the dead shifted, blurred around him, roaring their curses and bellowing their anger. But their hate of him only made him stronger. The long sword flung men out of his path and left them twisted and broken, hacked and drooling, howling with happiness. Who fought who was none of his concern. The living were on one side and he was on the other, and he carved a red and righteous way through their ranks. An axe flashed in the sun, a bright curve like the waning moon, and the bloody nine slid below it, kicked a man away with a heavy boot. He lifted up a shield, but the great sword split the painted tree and the wood beneath it and the arm beneath that, and tore open the mail behind as though it was nothing but a cobweb, and split his belly like a sack of angry snakes. A boy child cowered and slithered away on his back, clutching at a great shield and an axe too big for him to lift. The bloody nine laughed at his fear, teeth bared bright and smiling. A tiny voice seemed to whisper for restraint, but the bloody nine hardly heard it. His sword hard swung, split big shield and small body together, and sprayed blood across the dirt and the stone and the stricken faces of the men watching. Good, he said, and he showed his bloody smile. He was the great leveller. Man or woman, young or old, all were dealt with exactly alike. That was the brutal beauty of it, 
the awful symmetry of it, the perfect justice of it. There could be no escape and no excuses. He came forward, taller than the mountains, and the men shuffled and muttered and spread out from him. A circle of shields, of painted designs, of flowering trees and rippling water and snarling faces. Their words tickled at his ears. It's him. Nine fingers. The bloody nine. A circle of fear, with him at the centre, and they were wise to fear. Their deaths were written in the shapes of sweet blood on the bitter ground. Their deaths were whispered in the buzzing of the flies on the corpses beyond the wall. Their deaths were stamped on their faces, carried on the wind, held in the crooked line between the mountains and the sky. Dead men all. Who's next to the mud? he whispered. A bold Carl stepped forward, a shield on his arm with a coiled serpent upon it. Before he could even lift his spear, the bloody nine sword had made a great circle above the top of his shield and below the bottom of his helmet. The point of the blade stole the jawbone from his head, cleaved into the shoulder of the next man, ate deep into his chest, and drove him into the earth, blood flying from his silent mouth. Another man loomed up, and the sword fell on him like a falling star, crushed his helmet and the skull beneath it down to his mouth. The body dropped on its back and danced a merry jig in the dirt. Dance! laughed the bloody nine, and the sword reeled around him. He filled the air with blood and broken weapons and the parts of men, and these good things wrote secret letters and described sacred patterns that only he could see and understand. Blades pricked and nicked and dug at him, but they were nothing. He repaid each mark upon his burning skin one hundredfold, and the bloody nine laughed, and the wind and the fire and the faces on the shields laughed with him and could not stop. He was the storm in the high places, his voice as terrible as the thunder, his arm as quick, as deadly, as pitiless as the lightning. He rammed the sword through a man's guts, ripped it back, and smashed a man's mouth apart with the pommel, snatched his spear away with his free hand, and flung it through the neck of a third, split a carl's side yawning open as he passed. He reeled, spun, rolled, drunk and dizzy, spitting fire and laughter. He forged a new circle about him, a circle as wide as the giant's sword, a circle in which the world belonged to him. His enemies lurked beyond its limit now, shuffled back from it, full of fear. They knew him, he could see it in their faces. They had heard whispers of his work, and now he had given them a bloody lesson, and they knew the truth of it, and he smiled to see them enlightened. The foremost of them held up his open hand, bent forward, and laid his axe down on the ground. You are forgiven, whispered the bloody nine, and let his own sword clatter to the dirt. Then he darted forward and seized the man by his throat, lifting him up into the air with both his hands. He thrashed and kicked and wrestled, but the bloody nine's red grip was the swelling ice that bursts the very bones of the earth apart. You are forgiven! His hands were made of iron, and his thumb sunk deeper and deeper into the man's neck until blood welled up from under them, and he lifted the kicking corpse out to arm's length and held it above him until it was still. He flung it away, and it fell upon the mud and flopped over and over in a manner that greatly pleased him. Forgiven! He walked to the bright archway through a cringing crowd, shying away like sheep from the wolf, leaving a muddy path through their midst, strewn with their fallen shields and weapons. Beyond, in the sun, bright-armoured horsemen moved across the dusty valley, their swords twinkling as they rose and fell, herding running figures this way and that, riding between the high standards, rippling gently in the wind. He stood in that ragged gateway, with the splintered doors under his boots and the corpses of his friends and of his enemies scattered about him, 
and he heard the sounds of men cheering victory, and Logan closed his eyes and breathed. Chapter 28 Too Many Masters in spite of the hot summer day outside, the banking hall was a cool, dim, shadowy place, a place full of whispers and quiet echoes, built of sharp, dark marble like a new tomb. Such thin shafts of sunlight as broke through the narrow windows were full of wriggling dust motes. There was no smell to speak of, except the stench of dishonesty, which even I find almost overpowering. The surroundings may be cleaner than the House of Questions, but I suspect there is more truth told among the criminals. There were no piles of shining gold ingots on display. There was not so much as a single coin in evidence, only pens and ink and heaps of dull paper. Valent and Bulk's employees were not swaddled in fabulous robes, such as Magister Colt of the Mercers had worn. They did not sport flashing jewels, as Magister Ida of the Spices had. They were small, grey-dressed men with serious expressions. The only flashing was from the odd pair of studious eyeglasses. So this is what true wealth looks like. This is how true power appears. The austere temple of the Golden Goddess. He watched the clerks working at their neat stacks of documents, at their neat desks arranged in neat rows. There the acolytes, inducted into the lowest mysteries of the church. His eyes flickered to those waiting. Merchants and moneylenders, shopkeepers and shysters, traders and tricksters in long queues or waiting nervously on hard chairs around the hard walls. Fine clothes, perhaps, but anxious manners. The fearful congregation, ready to cower should the deity of commerce show her vengeful streak. But I am not her creature. Glockter shouldered his way past the longest queue, the tip of his cane squealing loud against the tiles, snarling, I am crippled, if one of the merchants dared to look his way. The clerk blinked at him when he reached the front of the line. How may I— Mouthith, barked Glockter. And who shall I say is the cripple? Convey me to the high priest that I might cleanse my crimes in banking notes. I cannot simply— You are expected. Another clerk a few rows back had stood up from his desk. Please come with me. Glockter gave the unhappy Q a toothless leer as he limped out between the desks toward a door in the far-panelled wall, but his smile did not last. Beyond it, a set of high steps rose up, light filtering down from a narrow window at the top. What is it about power that it has to be higher up than everyone else? Can a man not be powerful on the ground floor? He cursed and struggled up after his impatient guide, then dragged his useless leg down a long hallway with many high doors on either side. The clerk leaned forward and humbly knocked at one, waited for a muffled, yes, and opened it. Malthus sat behind a monumental desk watching Glockter hobble over the threshold. His face could have been carved from wood for all the warmth or welcome it displayed. On the expanse of blood-coloured leather before him, pens and ink and neat piles of papers were arranged with all the merciless precision of recruits on a parade ground. The visitor you were expecting, sir, the clerk hastened forward with a sheaf of documents. And there are also these for your attention. Malthus turned his emotionless eyes to them. Yes, 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 yes. All these to Talons. Glockter did not wait to be asked, and I've been in pain for far too long to pretend not to be. He took a lurching step and sagged into the nearest chair, stiff leather creaking uncomfortably under his aching arse. But it will serve. The papers crackled as Malthus leafed through them, his pen scratching his name at the bottom of each one. He paused at the last. 
And no, this must be called in at once. He reached forward and took hold of a stamp, its wooden handle polished by long use, and rocked it carefully in its tray of red ink. It thumped down against the paper with a disturbing finality. And is some merchant's life squashed out under that stamp, do we suppose? Is that ruin and despair so carelessly administered? Is that wives and children out upon the street? There is no blood here, there are no screams, and yet men are destroyed as completely as they are in the house of questions, and with a fraction of the effort. Glockter's eyes followed the clerk as he hurried out with the documents. Or is it merely a receipt for ten bits refused? Who can say? The door was pulled softly and precisely shut with the gentlest of smooth clicks. Malthus paused only to align his pen precisely with the edge of his desk, then he looked up at Glockter. I am truly grateful that you have answered promptly. Glockter snorted. The tone of your note did not seem to allow for delay. He winced as he lifted his aching leg with both hands and heaved his dirty boot up onto the chair beside him. I hope you will return the favour and come promptly to the point. I am extremely busy. I have magi to destroy and kings to bring down, and if I cannot do one or the other, I have a pressing appointment to have my throat cut and be tossed in the sea. Malthus's face did not so much as flicker. Once again, I find that my superiors are not best pleased with the direction of your investigations. Is that so? Your superiors are people of deep pockets and shallow patience. What now offends their delicate sensibilities? Your investigation into the lineage of our new king, his august majesty Giselle I. Glockter felt his eye twitch, and he pressed his hand against it with a sour sucking of his gums. In particular, your inquiries into the person of Kame Dan Roth, the circumstances of her untimely demise, and the closeness of her friendship with our previous king, Guslaf V. Do I come close enough to the point for your taste? A little closer than I would like, in fact. Those inquiries have scarcely even begun. I find it surprising that your superiors are so very well informed— do they acquire their information from a crystal ball, or a magic mirror, or from someone at the House of Questions who likes to talk, or from someone closer to me even than that, perhaps? Malthus sighed, or at least he allowed some air to issue from his face. I told you to assume that they know everything. You will discover it is no exaggeration, particularly if you choose to try and deceive them. I would advise you very strongly against that course of action. Believe me when I say, muttered Glockter through tight lips, that I have no interest whatsoever in the king's parentage, but his eminence has demanded it, and keenly awaits the report of my progress. What am I to tell him? Malthus stared back with a face full of sympathy, as much sympathy as one stone might have for another. My employers do not care what you tell him, provided that you obey them. I see that you find yourself in a difficult position, but speaking plainly, Superior, I do not see a choice for you. I suppose you could go to the Arch-Lector and lay before him the whole history of our involvement— the gift you took from my employers, the conditions under which it was given, the consideration you have already extended to us. Perhaps his eminence is more forgiving of divided loyalties than he appears to be. Huh, snorted Glockter. If I did not know better, I might have almost taken that for a joke. His eminence is only slightly less forgiving than a scorpion, and we both know it. Or you could honour your commitment to my employers and do as they demand. They asked for favours when I signed the damn receipt. Now they make demands? Where does it end? 
That is not for me to say, Superior, or for you to ask. Malthus's eyes flickered towards the door. He leaned across his desk and spoke soft and low. But if my own experience is anything to go by, it will not end. My employers have paid, and they always get what they have paid for. Always. Glockter swallowed. It would seem that in this case they have paid for my abject obedience. It would not normally be a difficulty. Of course, I am every bit as abject as the next man, if not more so. But the Archlector demands the same. Two well-informed and merciless masters in direct opposition begins, too late, to seem like one too many. Two too many, some might say. But as Malthus so kindly explains, I have no choice. He slid his boot off the chair, leaving a long streak of dirt across the leather, and shifted his weight painfully as he began the long process of getting up. Is there anything else, or do your employers merely wish me to defy the most powerful man in the Union? They wish you also to watch him. Glockter froze. They wish me to what? There has been a great deal of change of late, Superior. Change means new opportunities, but too much change is bad for business. My employers feel a period of stability is in everyone's best interests. They are satisfied with the situation. Malthus clenched his pale hands together on the red leather. They are concerned that some figures within the government may not be satisfied, that they may seek further change, that their rash actions might lead to chaos. His eminence concerns them especially. They wish to know what he does, what he plans. They wish, in particular, to know what he is doing in the university. Glockter gave a splutter of disbelieving laughter. Is that all? The irony was wasted on Malthus. For now, it might be best if you were to leave by the back entrance. My employers will expect news within the week. Glockter grimaced as he struggled down the narrow staircase at the back of the building, sideways on like a crab, the sweat standing out from his forehead, and not just from the effort. How could they know? First that I was looking into Prince Reynolds' death against the Archlector's orders, and now that I am looking into Our Majesty's mother on the Archlector's behalf. Assume they know everything, of course, but no one knows anything without being told. Who told? Who asked the questions about the Prince and about the King, whose first loyalty is to money? who has already given me up once to save his skin. Glockter paused for a moment in the middle of the steps and frowned. Oh, dear, dear, is it every man for himself now? Has it always been? The pain shooting up his wasted leg was the only reply. Chapter 29 Sweet Victory West sat, arms crossed upon his saddle-bow, staring numbly up the dusty valley. "'We won,' said Pike, in a voice without emotion, just the same voice in which he might have said, "'We lost.' A couple of tattered standards still stood, hanging lifeless. Bethod's own great banner had been torn down and trampled beneath horses' hooves, and now its threadbare frame stuck up at a twisted angle, above the settling fog of dust like clean-picked bones, a fitting symbol for the sudden fall of the King of the Northmen. Polder reined in his horse beside West, smiling primly at the carnage like a schoolmaster at an orderly classroom. How did we fare, General? Casualties appear to have been heavy, sir, especially in our front ranks, but the enemy were largely taken by surprise. Most of their best troops were already committed to the attack on the fortress. Once our cavalry got them on the run, we drove them all the way to the walls. Picked their camp clean. Polder wrinkled his nose, moustaches trembling with distaste. 
Several hundred of those devilish shanka we put to the sword, and a much greater number we drove off into the hills to the north, from whence, I do not doubt, they will be greatly reluctant to return. We wrought a slaughter among the northmen to satisfy King Casimir himself, and the rest have laid down their arms. We guess at five thousand prisoners, sir. Bethod's army has been quite crushed. Crushed! He gave a girlish chuckle. No one could deny that you have well and truly avenged the death of Crown Prince Ladislaw today, Lord Marshal. West swallowed. Of course, well and truly avenged. A masterstroke, to use our Northmen as a decoy, a bold and a decisive manoeuvre. I am and will always be honoured to have played my small part. A famous day for Union arms. Marshal Burr would have been proud to see it. West had never in his life expected to receive praise from General Polder, but now the great moment had come, he found that he could take no pleasure in it. He had performed no acts of bravery. He had taken no risks with his own life. He had done nothing but say charge. He felt saddle-sore and bone-weary. His jaw ached from being constantly clenched with worry. Even speaking seemed an effort. Is Bathod among the dead or the captured? As to specific prisoners, sir, I could not say. It may be that our northern allies have him. Polder gave vent to a jagged chuckle. In which case, I doubt he'll be with us much longer, eh, Marshal? Eh, Sergeant Pike? He grinned as he drew his fingers sharply across his belly and clicked his tongue. The bloody cross for him, I shouldn't wonder. Isn't that what they do, these savages? The bloody cross, isn't it? West did not see the funny side. Ensure that our prisoners are given food and water, and such assistance with their wounded as we are able to provide. We should be gracious in victory. It seemed like the sort of thing that a leader should say after a battle. Quite so, my Lord Marshal. And Polder gave a smart salute, the very model of an obedient underling, then reined his mount sideways and spurred away. West slid down from his own horse, gathered himself for a moment, and began to trudge on foot up the valley. Pike came after him, sword drawn. Can't be too careful, sir, he said. No, murmured West. I suppose not. The long slope was scattered with men alive and dead. The corpses of Union horsemen lay where they had fallen. Surgeons tended to the wounded with bloody hands and grim faces. Some men sat and wept, perhaps by fallen comrades. Some stared numbly at their own wounds. Others howled and gurgled, screamed for help or water. Still others rushed to bring it to them. Final kindnesses for the dying. A long procession of sullen prisoners was winding down the valley alongside the rock wall, watched carefully by mounted Union soldiers. Nearby were tangled heaps of surrendered weapons, piles of mail coats, stacks of painted shields. West picked his way slowly through what had been Bethard's camp, rendered in one furious half-hour into a great expanse of rubbish scattered across the bare rock and the hard earth. The twisted bodies of men and horses were mixed in with the trampled frames of tents, ripped and dragged out canvas, burst barrels, broken boxes, gear for cooking and mending and fighting. All trodden into the churned mud, stamped with the smeared prints of hooves and boots. In the midst of all this chaos, there were strange islands of calm where all seemed undisturbed, just as it must have been before West ordered the charge. A pot still hung over a smouldering fire, stew bubbling inside. A set of spears were neatly stacked against each other, with stool and whetstone beside, ready to be sharpened.